Coda was created to discuss philanthropy, civil society, and community. It is an opportunity to have a conversation with good people doing good things creatively and collaboratively. The format is a conversation, not a presentation. Two chairs, two tables, two computers, and a community of interested people. Today, we are pleased to have with us an engineer, father, and critical public figure. Special thanks to the Bush Foundation, the New Mag Group, Rural Philanthropy Institute, and the Garage for hosting today's conversation. Thanks to all those who joined us for the nearly 60 previous in-person conversations. Now with all that, we are pleased to welcome the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, Neil Kashkari. Neil, thanks for spending time this morning with us. And we're just gonna jump right into some questions. And the first question I think is on people's mind is, how does somebody like yourself, how do you and your family deal with and manage a time like this? How are you guys doing? Well, uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. You know, it's uh, in some ways, it's really similar to everybody else. So our bank went to work from home status for about 95% of our thousand employees uh, almost two months ago. So I'm in my basement right now, which is my kind of home office and my home gym, some gym equipment over there. <laughs> All the gyms are closed. Uh, we took, we have a young daughter, a 15 month old baby girl. We took her out of daycare, even though the daycare is still open. We took her out of daycare about a month or so ago. And um, my wife, uh, this is public knowledge, is one of the 33 million Americans who lost their jobs. She worked for a big travel company. Uh, mm. Now, we're very fortunate because I've got a good job, so we're going to be fine. But it's still a shock when somebody in your family loses their job. And, you know, she was a highly educated person just working in the travel industry. So that's the downside. The upside is we're getting to spend this amazing time with our daughter and just loving it and cherishing all the time we're getting to spend with her. So there are little benefits, even though overall it's, it's such a difficult time for our country. Sure, and just like balancing, as one person loses a job and you have your job, I mean, there's, there's a lot in that where you probably would never have imagined that would have been the case, as you said, educated people, but this strange times. Yeah, it is. And it's affecting, I mean, yeah, it's affecting, 30 plus million Americans are in the exact same boat. And um, again, we're the we're the lucky few who where I have a, you know, a very good job that's stable that uh, we're able, we're okay. Let's talk about the job. You're the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. What is it that you do in that position? And what's the purpose or role of the Federal Reserve Bank? Sure, well, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis is part of the Federal Reserve System. We are the nation's central bank. In 1913, Congress created the nation's central bank, and they wanted it to be different than other central banks around the world. Our basic job is managing the ups and downs of the U.S. economy. When the economy is looks like it's overheating, we'll tend to raise rates, interest rates, to make it more expensive to get a mortgage or to get a loan, to cool it down, or we will tend to cut rates if the economy is slowing down. But back in 1913, Congress said, we want to do something different with our central bank. We want to make sure all the regions of the country are represented in that process. So they created the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., and they created 12 independent Federal Reserve Banks around the country, the ninth of which is the Minneapolis Fed. And our job is to represent the ninth Federal Reserve District, which is Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, part of Michigan and part of Wisconsin. So a big part of my job is to get out with my uh, colleagues around our region, around our district, to get to know what's happening in the local economy. And then when I would go back to Washington, D.C. every six weeks for what are called FOMC meetings, Federal Open Market Committee meetings, where we set interest rates for the nation, I speak about what's happening here in our region and in South Dakota. So right now, we're not for the COVID crisis. I'd be in Rapid City. We'd be having this conversation mm -hmm. on, or in person. And mm -hmm. I'm hearing from you all. I'd be spending a couple days there to learn what's happening in the Rapid City economy. I've been to Rapid City before. I've been to other cities in South Dakota. I'm now going around for another loop, so to speak. And getting intelligence on the ground from what's happening in the local economy is really important so I can bring that back to Washington so we can make the best decisions we can for the country. Neil, how would you have described the economy in January for, the, for this region, for our region? I mean, overall, very good. I mean, the ag sector has been under pressure for a number of years, uh, but one of the things that we all benefit from is that we generally have a diverse economy. I mean, generally, when one sector is down, you have other sectors that are performing better, and they balance each other out. Uh, South Dakota's unemployment rate was low. 
Uh, the economy was growing. Uh, Rapid City and Sioux Falls were doing well, I think, overall. And there's, you know, there's innovation going on. There are new companies being formed. So I think overall, back in January, it would have been a, an, an optimistic view of where the economy was. And most people who had who wanted to work had jobs and wages were slowly climbing. But those are overall good, solid ingredients. I wouldn't have called it a gangbusters economy, but I would have called it a strong economy that was growing and people were enjoying the benefits of that. And it's just a shame that in a few months, this, uh, this health crisis has just hammered the whole U.S. economy, including South Dakota. The Federal Reserve Bank's action in response to the COVID pandemic are different than the actions that were taken in the 2008 recession. You are well aware of the 2008 recession and oversaw the TARP program. What are the what were the three big learnings from 2008 that you're bringing into this crisis, this national emergency? Well, one important difference is that the 2008 crisis was a banking center crisis. It was a housing crisis first and foremost. And so being a banking center crisis, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury were really the first responders. And I was at the U.S. Treasury Department then, uh, so I had firsthand experience going through that. In this crisis, this is first and foremost a health crisis. The first responders are the doctors and the nurses and the scientists who are trying to work on breakthrough vaccines or therapies to get us through this. And we our economy, we're not going to uh, fix our economy until we get our hands around the virus. So we just have to keep reminding ourselves, first and foremost, this is a healthcare crisis. The Federal Reserve's role in this case is to try to make sure the financial system continues to function uh, efficiently and effectively. And I'll give you an example. So there are parts of our economy today that are working well. So think about the big food producers. All of us are going to the grocery store and eating in instead of eating out. So the people who supply the grocery stores are doing well, the general mills of the world. Well, if those companies that are doing well today can't raise money because the capital markets aren't functioning, because the bond market is not functioning. That's how this healthcare crisis would infect other sectors of the U.S. economy. So one of the things the Federal Reserve did in March when this thing really flared up and the financial markets really started coming under pressure is we started putting a lot of, we call it liquidity, putting a lot of cash out in the financial system just to make sure that the financial system was functioning appropriately so that companies could raise money. And I think those actions were, number one, very aggressive, more aggressive than we did in 2008. We learned from that. And number two, they were effective in getting the capital markets reopened. You, and just because South Dakota and Smithfield has been in the news recently, you just talked about this supply chain for our food system. We talk a little bit about, uh, You want to? can you add anything about that with what you've seen and read about Smithfield and the government coming in and making sure that uh, workers are working in this time. Um, how does that play a part in what you're... You know, I visited, a, as part of my outreach, I, I was in Worthington, Minnesota a year or two ago, and I visited, I toured the JBS uh, pork plant. I think they did 20,000 pigs a day. I mean, huge volume. Mm -hmm. Those are tough, tough jobs in good times and tough conditions, people working shoulder to shoulder. Uh, I mean, there's no question the food supply is absolutely paramount, more, probably more important than anything else we're going to do. I mean, health and food are probably the two most important things we got to eat. Uh, but I also, um, you know, these, the folks working in those plants are not highly paid people, right? I mean, and that's what's so unfair about this crisis. I can work from home. Generally speaking, more highly educated white collar employees, not everybody, but generally speaking, are more equipped to work from home than the nature of their jobs. And so what's so devastating about this crisis is it is it's like the virus and is targeting the people who can least afford to lose their jobs and to lose their wages. Or in the case of the folks working in the meat processing plants, they're they're at much greater exposure than you or I am sitting here. Okay. I'm sitting here in my basement. I'm not at any risk here. And so I hope that it's important to get the plants running. But boy, I hope that the companies and the government are doing everything they can to provide a safe environment for those workers. What does that tell you, Neil, what's that tell you? It just seems where there's an, it seems like there's strange play here that the folks that we're relying on to ensure the critical access, whether it's for medical, for, for, uh, to meet our medical needs or to our, our health needs, there's basic 
means rely on people uh, and many times that are risking their health and family's health, uh, maybe not being compensated and the way that uh, as you as you described uh, appropriately or, or what does that say about our economy as a whole and the way it's structured? Does it tell, does it tell us anything about about that? The things that we rely most on that are necess necessities in our society? I mean, it's a, it's an age old, it's an age old fact. It doesn't make it any better, but I think it's true. I read a lot of history, a lot of American history. Uh, in the Civil War, people could pay rich, rich, rich young men could pay uh, low income young men to take their spot in the war. Uh, in some cases, uh, you know, it's tough. If you think about this. I want some. A lot of people are using Instacart. I haven't used it yet. Yeah. People use Instacart to say, "Here's what I want for the groceries." Somebody goes and buys the groceries and brings it to them. I mean, you're paying for convenience, but you're also paying for somebody else to take the risk of going into the store and being exposed by other people. And so, um, you know, in, in the Vietnam War, if you were going to college, you didn't get drafted. And so that was another way of segmenting of who's who's exposed and who's risk. So, uh, you know, this doesn't make it better. Uh, it's just been it's been a feature or fact of our society for a long time. And I don't know what to do about it. You mentioned that this is not a it's not a financial crisis. Um, for financial institution crisis like 2008. Um, you wrote an op-ed for the Financial Times, I believe, that talked about the most patriotic thing that banks could do now would be stop paying dividends and raise equity um, to prepare for uh, a second round. That, that makes sense if you're looking long-term and you're seeing some things um, what, that, that, that indicate that we're going to be in a, a recession for a good period of time. What's going to move this or what are your thoughts of moving this from Main Street to um, Wall Street? W when will that happen uh, like, you're, like you wrote about? Well, the, the big question mark for all of us is what's the path of the virus? The path of the virus is going to determine the path of the, path of the economy. And a couple months ago, I was much, I was more optimistic that maybe this could be a short downturn. <clears throat> we clamped down really hard for a couple months. We effectively extinguished the virus, and then we reopen and go back to normal very, very quickly. Unfortunately, what we've learned is happening in the past couple months is the virus continues to spread. It's spreading in South Dakota. It's spreading in Minnesota. And we've flattened the peak, but we have not extinguished the virus. And we look around the world. There's evidence that when countries relax their social distancing, relax their economic controls, if the virus is still spread in society, it tends to flare back up again. And so this my looking at that, talking to the epidemiologists that I'm speaking with and our economists are speaking with, it looks like this is going to be a long process. This is not going to be a couple months and we're done. You know, the best the scientists say the best hope we have for a vaccine is probably 18 months from now. And even then it's on, it's not there's no guarantee that we're gonna have a vaccine 18 months from now. And so we might be in this for a while, a long time. And think about this. So coffee shops that have been shut, restaurants that are shut, small businesses that are shut, the Paycheck Protection Program has been floating them for a couple months. What happens after a couple months? And if these businesses cannot open up for a year, some of them, many of them are probably gonna go out of business and they have a, a lease to pay or they have a mortgage. And if they don't pay their lease, at their storefront, then their strip mall owner can't pay his mortgage. And so the longer this goes on, these losses roll up into the banking sector. <clears throat> and the banks can't simply not pay their liabilities because their liabilities are our deposits. So they have to keep paying our deposit in interest, even though it's low, they have to keep paying that. And so that ends up hitting their bottom line, that hits their balance sheet, that hits their capital, and that's what can put them under pressure. So I wrote that the best thing the biggest banks could do today would be to stop paying dividends and go raise capital to essentially inoculate themselves against this virus. And then if it turns out this is, it ends up not being so bad, they can always return the capital. They can pay dividends later. They can buy back their stock later. Uh, I'm not optimistic that the banks are going to do this, but I think it'd be the right thing for them to do.
if that would be the right thing and the most patriotic thing for the big banks to do, what would you, what would you say the most patriotic thing for Americans, for individuals to do? You know, it's uh, do our part and follow the guidance of healthcare experts. The healthcare experts are not saying the things that they're saying to try to scare us or to try to control us or manipulate us. They're doing it to try to save lives. I mean, depending how you count it, COVID is now in the nation, one of the, if not the highest cause of death. So this is not some, I mean, you read these things online or you see some people interviewed to say, oh, this is just the flu. I wish it were just the flu. And I mean, never in my lifetime, I'm just going to go back. In my lifetime, have I ever seen images of hospitals in America overwhelmed? The only time I ever saw images of hospitals in America overwhelmed is, let's say, it's a hurricane hitting Florida or hitting Louisiana, New Orleans. Local hospitals might be overwhelmed. But what happened in New York could happen in Minnesota, could happen in South Dakota. And the challenge in part for our region, you know, we've got very strong healthcare centers in Rapid City and Sioux Falls. But a lot of rural, our rural country does not have big health care capacity. And so even though people are spread out, it doesn't take a lot to overwhelm their limited health care resources if there's a flare up in one of these towns across South Dakota or across Minnesota. You have led the bank uh, with a statement that we serve the best to grow on a stable financial system that works for all of us. And you just mentioned the, the leading cause of death might be COVID now. And that made me think of last week, I think it's a New York Times reported that as we open states, cities, counties, states, the, the report, internal report, I think from the White House, the New York Times reports is that on about, about 3,000 people will, be, will die on June 1st from COVID. And that's up from 70 percent, that's up 70 percent from uh, about 1750, 1750 in the past week per day. Um, I mean, there's a calculation being made to open up the economy. This must, and I, would you talk about the difficulty in hearing the data from medical ex experts and the implication, the, the the lives that will be impacted on that with the decision of opening up the economy, especially over the years of really focusing on creating an economy that works for all individuals. We talk about that for a bit. This is what's so uh, difficult about this. And there's no easy answer. You know, it, after the financial crisis in 2008, it took more than 10 years to put our economy back together and to put the labor market back together and to bring folks along and to get everybody working again and to get wages growing. It took 10 years to return to a labor market that was as strong as it was back in 2006. So a lot of the folks that just got hired in the last year or two and just started getting some wages blown up are the ones who've been laid off. And that's what's so you know, devastatingly unfair about this crisis. So on one hand, you cannot simply close the economy and completely lock it down for the next 18 months because we'll be in a Great Depression if we try to do that, a complete lockdown. And that would lead to a lot of loss of life. In economic devastations, people lose hope. They have emotional challenges and uh, pressures. You have suicides. People don't have money to get access to health care. That would also lead to a lot of deaths. It'd be different deaths, but they would also lead to a lot of deaths. The other hand, you can't simply say, well, we're all going to go back to normal and just pretend like it's January again and start spending again because then you'll have likely have flare-ups of the virus, and that will lead to a lot of deaths. And by the way, one of the challenges with overwhelming the hospitals is that even if you don't have COVID, but heaven forbid you get in a car accident or you have a heart attack, and you go to the emergency room, but they're overwhelmed with COVID patients and you can't get treatment, that will lead to a lot of other deaths. So on both extremes, you end up potentially having a lot of deaths. So the question now is, in a sense, how do we learn to live with this until we hopefully get a breakthrough vaccine or a breakthrough therapy? How do we live with it by opening up in a smart manner where certain businesses you can't socially distance? You know, certain distances just, uh, certain businesses just lend themselves to it. You can wear a mask, you can have basic hygiene. Other businesses like a movie theater, I don't see how we're gonna open movie theaters until we actually have a vaccine or have a therapy. I mean, I'm not gonna go back 
and sit with a couple hundred other people, you know, at a movie theater. And, I, and by the way, the last thing I'll just say on this is it's really not up to the governors and the president when we reopen. It is up to the American people when everybody feels safe to take their family back out to dinner or to a movie or to a ball game. And that means we have to have some safety. That's a really good point. The Atlantic, uh, Atlantic had an article to that point exactly. Eight out of ten people, eight out of ten Americans oppose opening movie theaters and gyms. Um, three quarters don't support letting sit-down restaurants and nail salons reopen. A uh, third or less would allow barber shops, gun stores, retail to operate. So as things do open up, as different in different cities, counties, states, what happens to our economy when if these numbers hold true? What happens, so if people for the next three months decide we're going to still shelter in place uh, predominantly or six months do that, what is, what is our, what does our economy look like, Neil, and what, what, yeah, what is the Fed able and willing to do? Well, it's, you know, there's been a lot of debate, you might read about this, but is it going to be a V-shaped recovery, meaning like a quick downturn and then a quick bounce back? Uh, we were, I was more hopeful of that a couple months ago. Or is it going to be more of a gradual muted recovery? I think it's more likely, based on what we know now, a gradual muted recovery. In part because of the what you just talked about, you know, people not feeling confident, and I don't feel confident to go back out and go back to normal. And it'll be slow. I mean, you're going to see some people who say, "No, I'm just going to do it." I'm, I, you know, younger people are at lower risk than older people. They're going to go first, and then we're going to watch and we're going to see: Are they safe when they do that? Are there flare-ups? And hopefully, we're um, expanding our testing capacity so we can detect flare-ups and hopefully clamp back down. I mean, my best guess, if I try to look at it over the next six months or a year, we'll probably have different parts of the country opening at different rates, and you'll probably see different flare-ups, and there may be clamping back down in some areas, and it's okay in other areas, and we might just have this uneven crawling back up to more of a normal economy until we get to some form of treatment or some form of vaccine. And that means, unfortunately, more of a muted recovery. And really, you know, the Federal Reserve, we can, uh, we, we're a lending agency. We provide loans to the, to the financial system, the financial markets. Uh, in that kind of an environment, my, ex, my expectation, my be best guess is Congress will need to do more because a lot of Americans are still going to be unemployed. And they've, they've been very bold. I really applaud what Congress has done so far. They've come together taken bold action for the country, it's likely they'll need to take more action to support those workers who have been unemployed through no fault of their own. I mean, that's the biggest thing. The biggest difference between this and 08, nobody's at fault here. This is a natural disaster. This is not banks rolling the dice and taking big risks or people buying homes they couldn't afford. This is a natural disaster, a virus that's infecting people, Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter the color of your skin, it's infecting people. And I think Congress sees that. And that's why they're saying we have to do whatever we can to support the, the public. Last week, and we're talking about the impact, obviously it's impacting everybody, but particularly the folks as we talked about, like your wife and your family, uh, when, when you lose a job, you talked about, uh, I think last week, that you believe that right now the numbers of unemployment are underrepresented. We talk a little bit about, I think you talk, you, your, your projection is that it's 22 to 24% really uh, unemployed at this point. What do you think about people that are being, uh, if you add the PPP uh, businesses to that, what, what number does that get us at? Um, where, where do you see unemployment going and when has it ever been like this? So the official unemployment statistic that came out last week is national unemployment is 14.7%. But the way they do that is they call up people, they do phone surveys, and they ask you, are you working? No. Are you looking for a job? And unless you report that you're actively looking for a job, you're not counted as unemployed. Well, we're telling everybody the shelter is in place right now. So a lot of people lost their jobs, and they're not out looking for a job because we told everybody to stay home. So one of the undercounting are simply people who said who lost their job and they're not looking right now because they're being safe. So we know that's an undercount. Another undercount, I think, 
is a lot of the workers reported, I am employed, but I'm at home on furlough, essentially. And my hope is I get to go back. <clears throat> well, the longer this goes on, unfortunately, the more likely those temporary layoffs are going to become permanent. And so if we just compare who was working in February and who is working now, that difference leads you to about a 23, 24% number is the true unemployment rate. And by the way, unfortunately, that data is a few weeks old. And in the last few weeks, 11 more million people have filed for unemployment insurance. So, you know, it's, it's above 23, 24% now is the true unemployment rate as an apples to apples comparison to the 3.5% number that we had in February. Neil, this is unemployment. Does it reach 35%? I don't know. I mean, this is just, we've never seen a, a complete shutdown of the economy as quickly as we are right now. And I mean, the hope is that if states, as they are reopening, and we are finding this middle ground, so to speak, of reopening safely, that some of those folks will be brought back. So, you know, yesterday you and I talked to some folks in your area who have some coffee shops and that they're, they've are they got a drive-through service and they've got a window, a storefront window kind of thing. So um, the hope is that some of those folks will start coming back online, back to work and doing it safely so that we can at least stop the unemployment numbers from going up and up and up and hopefully start bringing them back down. But again, what's really going to determine this is the virus. And the, and people's comfort. I agree. And, people's comfort and people, is back to the virus. It's going to go right. back to what we're seeing uh, with, with our neighbors when we read the newspaper on TV, et cetera. And as there's more deaths in, with, due to COVID, one would think people would continue to want to shelter in place like the Atlantic Air Magazine article. That, and, and if that per, per, if that continues, do you see more stimulus dollars or do you see that our current um, unemployment platform can handle the increase? Well, um, first of all, I would just uh, make a minor adjustment to what you just said. I don't consider what the government has done stimulus. Right now, st stimulus, traditionally, what we mean by that is if the economy is falling and there's not enough demand, we want to encourage people to go out there and spend, spend, spend to boost demand. Right now, we're not actually trying to stimulate the economy. We're just trying to rescue businesses that are failing and people that are getting laid off to give them enough money to make ends meet to bridge this. Once we get through the healthcare crisis, there will be time for stimulus to boost it, to get so the recovery can be as fast as possible. So that's just a minor, uh, just to, you want to respond to that? So do, so do you foresee as there is, as more people are engaging in the economy in more traditional ways, um, do you see then large stimulus uh, measures, more dollars pumped into the economy than the three trillion that's already been? Well. At some point, perhaps, I mean, I think before we get to that, my best guess is that there will likely need to be more support given to the workers that have been laid off. So Congress passed these uh, $600 top up, in a sense, per week unemployment benefits. And there's a debate going on whether those were, it was too high because it's encouraging people not to work even where they can work. That debate needs to happen. But my best guess is if this is a long, slow recovery, and the unemployment rate stays very high, let's say for the rest of the year. My expectation is Congress will likely step in, I would hope, and do more to provide support to folks that have been unemployed because they have rent to pay, mortgages to pay, car payments to make, cell phone bills, food to buy. I mean, that we need, if, they, if we don't allow them to pay their rent or pay their mortgage, that's how it ends up flowing through the banking system and the financial system, and then it leads to broader issues for our economy. You made this point that um, Congress has come together and the Fed, everybody seems to be on the same page that there needs to be this, infu this infusion of funds at this time because for um, many, for, because this uh, emergency um, is, is, is outside so many people's uh, is outside of our control. That leads to uh, a thought about 
it's easy today that uh, when it when impact when things impact our economy um, that uh, that affects a large amount of people that we can come together and do this. Why do you suppose it's so difficult that when we when we have large homeless populations and folks on food stamps or people struggling and a small amount of people in the country, it's hard. It's difficult for people to come around and provide that type of support that you're talking about uh, in relief? I think it's a couple of factors. One is it's things that we're used to. I mean, I'm not making, I'm not making light of it, but risk that we're used to, we come to grips with and versus new risks that we're not used to and that we haven't thought about. So, you know, we're all comfortable. The fact that driving in your car is not perfectly safe and that people do have car accidents every day and people die every day. Uh, as an example, so we're kind of comfortable with that risk, or the risk of other healthcare risks, risks of smoking, you know, other things that that we're just used to seeing in society. So they don't trigger this kind of everybody work together to try to tackle it right away. I think that's part of it. Uh, so homelessness, other things that you just talked about, have been in society for a very long time, and we're kind of used to that. Second thing I would say is there are lots of different small problems around society. And people have their different small problems that they're focused on. And so and they may not agree. Like is, is homelessness the biggest problem or is it education for low income kids the biggest problem that you're passionate about? And so I think that just the fact that there are lots of small problems, I mean, they're not small, they're important problems in society, but none of them are this big as the COVID crisis. It ends up being the people that are just focused on different things and then they can't get agreement. And then you end up not being able to fully address them. Neil, does this give us does this give our society an opportunity to address some of those um, issues in a different way? Does capitalism look different in two years? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. You know, the last thing we the last time we experienced something like this is before any of our lifetime, the flu pandemic of 1918, and we've studied it quite a bit just as parallels for today, what we can learn. And in that one, by the way, uh, you know, it broke. The flu started out in the spring. It went dormant over the summer. But the real devastation was in the fall. So that's something that I'm also, we're all paying attention to and worried about in this fall. But the flu pandemic, so you have World War I, 1914 to 1918, the flu pandemic, 1918, 1919. And then you have the Roaring Twenties. And so, you know, what's going to follow this? I don't think the Roaring Twenties were a time of rebuilding society to make it more inclusive. I think the Roaring Twenties, from what I recall of history, is uh, you know, well-to-do people did really, really well in markets and whatnot. So, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I, I, at a minimum, I think it's probably going to change. If you go to Asia before this, you would see lots of people wearing masks because they had much smaller outbreaks of SARS a decade ago. So I think some things will change, like you'll see people in America wearing masks on a regular basis. Maybe we're not going to shake hands the way we used to shake hands all the time. Um, I, at minimum, I would expect some of those smaller societal behavioral changes, whether it leads to a different architecture for our economy, I don't know. You mentioned that we can find ourselves, we, we accept uh, certain realities, whether a certain level of homelessness or whatnot. In a recent article, I think on Fox News, uh, it broke down, and correct me because I, I, you're the expert on this, that uh, before 2008, we barely ever used quanti uh, uh, quantitative easing, and the Fed's balance budget was about $870 billion. By 2014, the, but the Fed's balance sheet was $4.5 trillion. On May 6th, the balance sheet was $6.72 trillion, which was up $65 billion from the week before. Are we just more comfortable with debt? And, yeah, so first, are we just more comfortable with debt? And the fear of having debt pre-2008 was wrong? Well, I would say it's a very complicated question you asked. Um, just a few the minutes. <laughs> the Fed's balance sheet. So we have the, the, the reason that central banks 
have the power that they have in the economy is because they have the monopoly on creating money. So Congress gave the Fed the ability to, we're the only ones in the country that have the ability to make money. We basically created electronically and we created electronically and then get that money out into society by buying bonds. So we'll buy treasury bonds in exchange for the money that we just created and then banks can go deploy that money in society and loan money to you, et cetera, and all of, your, all of our viewers here today. So that's one separate issue. The, the real issue, I think, is the U.S. government's issuing of bonds to fund the spending that they're doing. So right now, for example, Congress spent about $3 trillion in this COVID crisis already. How they've done it, the Treasury is going out issuing bonds to the public and then using that money to spend on all the programs that we just talked about. So the U.S. government's debt level has been climbing in the, for the last 30 years, and it's now at a you know very high level relative to history. The last time we were this high was around World War II. I think one of the things that we've all learned is that the U.S. government has an extraordinary ability to support a lot of debt. Usually when, when governments issue a lot of debt, the fear is that it leads to inflation because you're basically, you're spending more than you're producing. And so if you're spending more, you're trying to consume more than you're producing, that leads to inflation. But what we've learned is that investors around the world have great confidence in the US economy and in our government, as imperfect as it is, to be able to manage this debt and eventually pay off this debt. Because even though the debt levels are still very high, the borrowing rates, the borrowing costs are very low. So the 10 year treasury yield is around 0.6%, which is very low relative to history. Let me, let me just say it another way, more simply. If you as an individual or your business took on more and more debt, and then you went to your bank and said, I want a loan to take on yet more debt, your bank would say, okay, but I'm going to charge you a very high interest rate because I'm nervous about your ability to pay it back to compensate us for the risk. Well, what investors around the world are saying is, even though the U.S. government has issued all this debt, we still have great confidence that they can pay it off. And so that's why the U.S. government is able to borrow as cheaply as they are. So long term, we have to deal with this. We have to get our fiscal house in order. But in this crisis, the U.S. government has the ability to raise the funds to support the American people. And we've seen we can live with it. Over the last 13 years, we've increased the debt. And you pointed out the last 30 years. We've increased uh, debt for the nation, and many people have done well. I mean, lots of prosperity and innovation and stuff. And um, so, what are the key indicators of confidence that you look at or the Fed looks at when referencing around the world? Um, is it as simple as are we sell are we able to sell the bonds at the with the interest rate that we put on it? Well, it's that's probably the most important signal. We we the interest rate in government debt has a couple components, has a bunch of things, but two main components. One is the real rate, so net of well, it's the real rate and then the inflation rate. So we look at inflation. Is inflation climbing? The biggest problem we've had over the past ten years, as it relates to inflation, is that it was a little bit lower than we wanted, rather than higher than we expected. We we set two percent as our target. So that's been our challenge is how do you get inflation to our 2% target? And then we have different measures of inflation expectations. What do investors think about inflation for the next five years, for the next 10 years and longer? And that also can be a, a leading indicator for us of what's likely to happen in the future and what investors are pricing in when they agree to buy these treasury bonds. All of those signal that inflation is more likely to be low rather than high over the last five, next five or 10 years. Now, so it's not, that's comforting, but I would say this, it is also a relative gain. The U.S. government and the U.S. economy is the strongest economy in the world, relative to Europe, relative to China. But if somehow Europe really got its house in order and their economy became very competitive and they started to grow, investors might say, hey, we'd rather invest in Europe. And then all of a sudden, U.S. Treasury bonds and the U.S. economy may not look like as good a place to invest because they could go to Europe or they could go to China. So right now, we are the strongest economy in the world. People have more confidence in our economy than anyone else's. But that's not always necessarily going to be the case. So the key is we should address this and we should make smart decisions for the long run. 
that improve our competitiveness in the long run. And then the inflation will take care of itself. Is there, in your mind, a top dollar of what our debt can be? So Japan has twice as much debt relative to their economy as we do. And they are able to finance it at very low rates. And so, you know, do we have the same debt capacity as Japan? Maybe. Is it higher? Is it lower? We just don't know. I mean, the challenge is you don't want to find out, right? You don't want to issue so much debt that you push the envelope and then all of a sudden uh, investors lose confidence and then rates would go up and then it'd be very expensive to service that debt. But I think right now, Congress doing what it needs to do to support the American people during this crisis is the right thing to do. And when we get through this crisis, we do need to put our fiscal house in order. And to put the fiscal house in order. So who, yeah, how are we going to do that? Well, the key is, if you look over the forecast the next 30 years, <clears throat> setting aside the COVID crisis, U.S. debt levels are projected to go up like this. And that's because our entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicare, are really funded by current workers paying for current retirees. We're having fewer kids than prior generations. So our society is aging. So those ratios are going down. And as those ratios go down, but the benefits are stay the same, the debt goes up to pay for the difference. So either you know we have to cut benefits or we have to raise taxes or we need to lean on immigration to grow our workforce so that we can keep these ratios in balance. That's just math. And so as a society, we need to confront those choices that we have. As we talk about the next 30 years, as you just mentioned, the next 30 years, you've led an effort in Minnesota uh, about to change uh, for a constitutional amendment to guarantee quality public education for all for every child. Would you talk a little bit about that effort and why that's important to you, what you see uh, uh, the meaning behind that? One of my big surprises coming to Minnesota, Minnesota has a lot of strengths, an overall highly educated workforce on average, good schools, a diverse economy. I was really surprised that Minnesota has some of the worst racial and economic disparities in the country. And when you dig down into that, it has some of the worst education disparities in the country. So <clears throat> minority kids in inner city schools are getting a much worse education than uh, white kids in suburbs. And if you go out to rural Minnesota, uh, rural kids in low income schools are getting a much worse education than well to do kids. White, you know, these are white rural kids versus white kids in uh, more well to do cities. And as I studied this with our economists and then I started talking to uh, a real leader in Minnesota, a former Minnesota Supreme Court Justice Alan Page, who spent a lifetime on education, uh, we realized that it was really the political system had failed to make changes, to, to make real changes to help all Minnesota children succeed. When you look around the country, some states have taken bold action to reform their education systems, and you can do this. Like there are states that are making big changes and lifting up kids of all economic backgrounds and all racial backgrounds. And it's great to see that hasn't happened in Minnesota. And we realized that it was, you know, Minnesota is kind of the divided state, right? We're the, I think the only uh, state in the country that has a divided legislature right now. And so the divided politics is good for some things, but it's been a, a barrier on making transformational education reform. So we propose to amend Minnesota's state constitution to make a quality public education a civil right for all children. And we believe by making this a literally a civil right that all children can get a quality public education and hold the state accountable to quality outcomes that we can break through the politics and literally put children first. So we've had to press pause on this uh, just because of the COVID crisis, but we remain committed to it. And Neil, would then that quality be defined in the courts? Or well, first thing, how does it yeah, the legislature would have the first, would define quality on how do you measure it, how do you make sure that everyone's getting the same, meeting the same standards. We don't want different standards for different kids. We don't want low-income kids, oh, we're going to have low expectations for you, and we're going to have high expectations for wealthy kids. Uh, we want high expectations for everybody. And then, the, the, importantly, families would have the ability, 
if the legislature does not act, families would have the ability to go to court to say my child's rights are being violated. And that can be a very powerful motivator to break through political log jams. You also have created the Federal Reserve Center for Indian Development or enhanced it over your, or over your uh, tenure. Will you talk a bit about why that's important to focus in an Indian country and the economic realities there in your region? Yes. So actually, before I joined the Minneapolis Fed, we, the bank had created the Center for Indian Country Development. Uh, yeah. And we, it's really, I mean, in our region, we have a lot of tribes. We have 11 in Minnesota itself. Uh, a lot of our population, a lot of our land around the region is tribal land. And making sure that all folks in our region can participate in our economy. <clears throat> you know, even just thinking about our conversation earlier this morning, 3.5% unemployment nationally back in February. Not if you go into most reservations. On most reservations, it's double or triple that. And the real numbers are even much higher than that when you think about how many people are not in the labor force. And I would have, I would have conversations. I'd have roundtables of business leaders who say, we can't find workers. And then the next roundtable I would have would be of tribal leaders. And they'd say, our folks can't find jobs. And how do you bridge that? so that we can bring them into the workforce so that they can benefit, their families can benefit, and our economy can benefit. So our, these, are, these are really tough, tough problems that relate to education. They're overlaid with security issues because there's, in cases there's drug abuse and crime, uh, and there's overlapping jurisdictions between tribal police and state police, et cetera. Uh, there's a lot of complex issues here but we're trying to do our part in using our research expertise to unravel this, to figure out what are public policy uh, levers that could bring more people into the economy so that the economy benefits and so that they benefit. And you've done some, uh, you, you've also launched the Opportunity Inclusive Growth Initiative to build research and, and gain and, and, and be able to uh, share data about our region for the same purposes. And you're looking at housing and a whole slew of different issues, right? That's right. So although at the Fed, we don't have, you know, we don't control education policy, we don't control housing policy. We have an army of PhD economists around the country doing brilliant research. We realized that we could focus some of that research on some of these other issues related to how do we have an economy that grows for everybody and brings people along that relates to education, relates to housing and other things, then we can arm other policymakers with that data and that analysis so that they can make the most informed policy decisions they can. So that center is a few years old. Uh, we just hired a new director for the center, Abby Wozniak from Notre Dame, a uh, terrific economist, labor economist. And, you know, we're really optimistic. Actually, one of the things that we're doing now, Abby, this was Abby's idea is we have a survey that we're partnering with a group in Washington called the Data Foundation. You know, one of the real challenges is we don't know how much the virus is spreading right now, going back to COVID. We don't know how many people have it. Is it accelerating or not? Because we're not able to test enough. And we're ramping up our testing capacity, but it's happening slowly. So Abby had an idea. Well, what if we conducted a massive phone survey every week and asked people, What's happening to you? Do you have flu-like symptoms? Do you have a fever? Or do you have a cough? Do you still have a job? What's happening to your wages? So a bunch of economic data, a bunch of personal data, and a bunch of health data. We've now been in the field for a couple of weeks. I think we're calling 10,000 people a week right now. And it's an experiment. We don't know. Is this going to give us an independent sense of what's happening in the economy in real time? and what's happening to the virus in real time. And might that be a complement to the health data that the healthcare experts are getting every day? So this is something that wasn't my idea. This was Abby's idea. She brought it forward. We heard it. We said, my gosh, we got to try mm -hmm. and see if it bears fruit. So we're, we're running an experiment right now. So having this, this team of brilliant economists who are thinking, you know, most of our economists have pivoted their research immediately to healthcare, COVID, crisis, how do we navigate this economy? So having this bench of terrific economic talent available to focus on this new crisis is really, it's really valuable to all of us. 
sure they have the the resources right there to do it and yeah. to just jump in and move the people's thinking as uh and focus on it absolutely um a series of other questions a series of other questions in the next nine minutes uh as we come to the uh, to the hour um you have a you have a young daughter you have played an instrumental role in the 2008 crisis and now this what will you tell her about this? What will you tell her about uh, the first uh, part of her life uh, regarding COVID when she's old enough? Well, I mean, I think the first thing I'll tell her is something I touched on earlier, which is just how much my wife and I are um, uh, cherishing the time that we're getting to spend with her, you know, just to get to go up at lunch and have lunch with her or put her down for her nap or be there uh, when she wakes up from her nap are very special. So that's the first thing that I'll share with her. Um, and then I think it's really going to depend. I mean, these events leave scars on society, right? The Great Depression left scars on the people who lived through it for the rest of their lives. And it changed their behavior, changed their investing behavior, changed how they saved, changed how they spent money. And it wasn't until another generation came along that some of those scars finally uh, wore off. The 2008 financial crisis has left scars. I mean, I know for me personally, Having been in the in the 08 crisis, I um, was a homeowner and I had a mortgage on my home, and I was really worried during the worst moments of the 08 crisis that I was going to lose my home because my savings were in money markets and the money markets were collapsing. And I said, "Oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to pay my mortgage." But I also knew millions of other people weren't going to be able to pay their mortgage, and the government stepped in and stabilized money markets, and so that's ended up how I was able to pay my mortgage. But that changed me. I hate that. I pay off whatever debt I can as quickly as I possibly can. And I don't want to take on more debt if I can possibly avoid it. So I think there's a lot that society will probably carry from this COVID crisis. And I'll tell my daughter about, hey, this is why it's that way. This, you know, maybe, maybe she may ask, why are we wearing masks regularly? Mm -hmm. well, let me tell you why we're wearing masks routinely. Or why don't we shake hands? I she'll watch old movies and everybody would shake hands, and maybe we're not gonna shake hands as much anymore. I think that a lot of those things I'll share with her about how society, this was an inflection point in society, how life was different before uh, and compared to what she's experiencing when she's older. What would you, what, what do you think the most important characteristic of a leader is? I, I think number one, walking the walk. I mean, I think credibility probably counts more than anything. I mean, if people aren't going to follow you, even if you've got great ideas, if people aren't going to follow you, it doesn't matter how good your ideas are and how do you get people to follow you. <coughs> it's when they see that uh, you're genuine, that your motives are aligned with what you say, and that you're actually walking the walk yourself. I think that's, if I had to pick one thing, that would be it. People can forgive a lot. You know, mm -hmm. they can forgive you not knowing, having all the answers. Uh, I think it's when they, it's hard to forgive when they, if they, detect that you're not being genuine. Do you have time for uh, other readings besides COVID and economic and financial issues? Is there, is there a book that you're reading right now that you'd recommend or well, a book that you would recommend? It's funny. I just finished. There's a, a very well-known epidemiologist at the University of Minnesota, Mike Osterholm, who we're working with a lot. And I just, after I talked to him the first time, I was really impressed by his 40 years of experience. So then I read, went back and read his most recent book, Deadliest Enemy. It's it's actually a fascinating read that's not that long, and I'd recommend it if anybody's interested in learning about epidemiology. Uh, but generally, I just read a lot of history. I read a lot of history about American history. I've read a lot about the revolution and the founding of the country, a lot about the Civil War, uh, and then more recently uh, dipped my toe into World War II. I just think there's so much to learn from history. Uh, I don't have much interest in fiction. I like to, I used to go to movies to get my fiction fix. Mm -hmm. But for reading, uh, it really is um, nonfiction and history more than anything. We had a question come up as we've been talking. They're referencing maybe a comment, and please correct this, I just share the comment maybe that you made in 2016 that you unlikely the Fed would ever implement negative rates. Has that changed in your mind? And please clarify. 
<clears throat> I don't think so. I don't think any of us have ruled it out and said never. But my colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee have been pretty unanimous in saying we don't think that's likely we would do it. There are other tools we would go to first. I mean, ultimately, why do we move? The rates that we move up and down are overnight interest rates, literally overnight, that banks charge each other. Why do we do that? Because that's a way of adjusting long-term rates. We move low, low, short-term rates down. It tends to move long-term rates down, but it's long-term rates that drive economic activity. We have other tools to affect long-term rates that we think are more powerful than just moving the short-term interest rate down to negative. So I don't want to say never, but there are other things that we would likely do first. Uh, best piece of advice to college graduate, what would you tell them? You know, it's, it, we know that this is a really tough time. Jobs are, that if they had a job, it's maybe getting canceled or that's getting put on hold. Your first job is not your last job, so get what work you can, get some experience. Uh, if you, by the way, if you were already thinking about going back to grad school, a lot of the times when these recessions hit, people use that as an opportunity to say, well, I was gonna go to law school in a few years, I might as well go now and kind of wait it out. That's another option. I wouldn't say go take on a bunch of debt just for the sake of taking on debt, but if you were planning on going back to school anyway, you know, this might be, a, this might be the time to do it. Uh, you might have to do it socially distance, socially distant learning like mm -hmm. we're doing now. Uh, but you know, just get some experience wherever you can, and uh, you know, keep working hard. And I think good opportunities will come your way. Best piece of advice for those frontline workers who are the medical staff, the nurses, the uh, folks in the food processing plants, for the grocery store clerks, and they're they're being honored in different ways and recognized, but yet they're being now uh, welcomed with furlough notices and uh, wage decreases, and um, they've done everything that they have been asked to do, but this cap is not working for them. What would you? Sh well, I think to the different groups there, I and mean, then the folks that are working in the hospitals and this um, deliveries, et cetera, you know, we need them. And so if they don't, if they're not getting the support they need, they need to speak up. And I think the American people will step up to support them because uh, they are continuing to provide a vital service for all of us to allow all of us to get through this. Uh, to the folks who have lost their jobs, you know, through no fault of their own, also speak up, make sure that their voices are heard so that uh, their elected representatives can hear them and can make sure that they are factoring them in as they're thinking about what comes next. Uh, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, and the more that people speak up and about what they're experiencing and what assistance they need, the more likely our political system will respond to them. Neil, thanks for taking time this morning. Really appreciate it, really informative. At this time, due to COVID, uh, as we've talked about, we, we're not in person. Um, we would love to make a, a donation uh, recognizing this, your your generosity and uh, spending the morning with us, we'll make that to the Black Hills Work Susie Kappa Arts Center in downtown Rapid City. So thank you for being with us this morning. There's a survey uh, for folks that are viewing, and uh, really appreciate uh, everyone tuning in and stay tuned to learn more about our next guest. But Neil, thanks. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You too. Bye now.